The Dentalpreneur Podcast. Okay, doctor, it's time to put down that handpiece. You're listening to the show dedicated to helping dentists get their lives back. It's time to decrease your stress, increase your profitability, and regain your passion. Now introducing your host, Dr. Mark Costas. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Dentalpreneur Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Mark Costas. What's up, my friends? I hope you're doing great out there today. Hey, listen, today we're going to be talking about some very, very interesting philosophies and and uh, some clinical dentistry, maybe a little bit of business. Um, and today I have a new friend that I'm going to introduce to you, the podcast audience, and that is Dr. Jill Wade. Dr. Jill is a progressive dentist centered around prevention and prides herself in being a leader in the industry. Her entire team is passionate about educating others that dentistry and optimal health care play a key role in the world of health and wellness. The Smile with Heart program is the first of its kind to co-manage patients alongside health professionals with diagnostics and blood work. The mouth is a window to the patient's overall health by paying close attention to the subtle differences we can uncover the root cause of inflammation a person may be experiencing. Welcome to the podcast, Jill. How are you today? I am great. How are you today? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Right off the bat, I can sense an accent. You are in Frisco, Texas. Are you a native Texan? I am born and bred Texan. Please do not hold that against me. <laughs> oh, no, not at all. Are you kidding? I love Texas. We had our um, annual summit in San Antonio this year. It was a great time and it was a little, a little oh, humid, good. but uh, I love that town. Oh, it's so fun down there. It's a great place. If you know, if you ever want to take your team somewhere, it's a fun, fun place to take teams. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. I do. I mean, you don't have to sell Texas on me. I really, really enjoy every time that I'm there. Um, and it's so convenient. It's right in the middle of the country. It's easy for both coasts to get there. Um, so yeah, it might be a place that we continue to have some of our larger meetings. Um, Jill, tell me a little bit about your history as a dentist and as a practice owner. Well, all right. So I love dentistry. I am super passionate about dentistry. I've been practicing for almost 25 years and mm-hmm. I enjoy it today as much as I did when I first got out of school. Amazing. And I think one of the reasons why is because I'm always willing to, you know, kind of uh, stay on top of my game. I don't sit and get settled too far in one particular, um, you know, item. Mm -hmm. It can be, you know, for those of us who do do that, it could be very Groundhog Day-ish. And, Mm -hmm. you know, what's fun about waking up every day if you think you're going to do the same day over again? So over the years, a lot in cosmetic dentistry. That's where I got most of my training back at Baylor College of Dentistry. Yes, now Texas A&M. Mm-hmm. But um, back at Mother Baylor, we did a AGD program, got a lot of training in cosmetic dentistry, mm-hmm. which basically allowed me to get out into practice Um practicing at the same level as, as people who had been out 10, 15 years beyond me. Mm -hmm. So it really started my philosophy, not only on how to do dentistry, how to service our, our clients, but also how to do the business of the business of dentistry a little bit different right off the bat. And then grew from that into a lot of the, what you were just talking about, the small with heart program and, and how we weaved in health and wellness into the practice, which is just, honestly, it just keeps it fun. It makes it, um, more about treating the patients and being a detective and trying to find the root cause of what's going on in their mouth rather than just doing the drill and bill and fill them kind of dentistry. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So, um, what was your timeline like after your residency? Uh, did you go out and buy a practice right away? Did you start one from scratch? Um, how does that part of your history go? Great question. Great question. I I always kind of laugh at people who who sit and can have, you know, a cup of coffee or adult beverage with me. And I always say, hey, wherever you are phase wise in your career, I've been there. Um, I first got out of school and obviously went back to school and was, you know, a, a practitioner still. Um, in school. I've taught at the school. Mm -hmm. I went right out of school and was an associate for someone. Okay. uh, And that was for about two years. And then I 
um, along with one of the young ladies that was in the AGD program with me, we started our own practice from scratch, zero patients, build it and they will come. <laughs> um, we did that. We uh, ended up separating our partnership and I went out on my own. I have then had associates. Um, I've uh, had partners. I've really just been through the whole gamut. I understand all all different sides to it. It's it's um, so many different ways out there right now that you can can do dentistry. I I find it very sad, in my opinion, that it by the time these students are getting out of school, they have so much debt going on. Mm-hmm. I can't imagine them being able to go right out and creating another huge lump sum of debt uh, to create their new practices. Mm-hmm. So I do believe that in the future, we're just going to see more and more associate type of partnerships um, having to occur because, you know, really, I I just don't know how they would afford going out and just starting right off the bat um, with the way the banking industry is and and things like that. And, And personally, I don't think it's a bad idea to do it that way. I feel like the schools were really struggling there for a little while. Um, getting the new students, um, especially during COVID, mm-hmm. um, up and able to see enough, you know, actual patients and do enough crowns to get out there and and really start um, taking great care of patients. So I think looking for associateships right now is probably the best idea for people out there. What, uh, what type of practice do you practice out now? So have you brought on Multiple providers? Are you a solo provider in your practice? Yeah. So over the years, I think I told you a little while ago, I started in Frisco, Texas, which is just north of Dallas, Mm -hmm. when there were only 14,000 people. Mm -hmm. And now it's grown to 200,000 people. So we've been super blessed to grow with the city and to grow with the community. And I was a solo practitioner for um, probably about five or six years. And then after I had my children, I um, got one associate. And then one associate grew into two associates. And now there are four of us. Oh, wow. And we just, um, all of us are females. So it's an all female practice. We all have children and we all work anywhere from two to three days a week. Gotcha. Gotcha. And how many hygienists do you support as four full-time or part-time providers? Yeah, we, we have four full-time hygienists. Gotcha. Okay. And so how many, how many rooms, how many treatment rooms does your practice have? We have uh, four doctor ops, four hygiene ops, and two consultation rooms, which are kind of multifunctional. We do a lot of, uh, you know, uh, wellness consultations, cosmetic consultations, and things like that. So we don't, um, you know, we use our rooms wisely. Uh, Those rooms that uh, cost so much to uh, get set up. We try to allow them to do what they do best, which is dentistry. Anything else other than that needs to be done in the consultation rooms, any kind of digital um, digital diagnostics or anything that we can do in, an, in a different room. That's what we do. Very nice. Awesome. Our whole building, and this is, this, boy, I could talk on this topic all day long too, because I think it's fascinating. All of that is done in 3,000 square feet. Wow. So eight total, so to eight total me- ops in 8,000? Yep. Or, I'm sorry, 3,000? Yeah. Yep. Awesome. Awesome. Eight and eight. Um, a big lab, you know, three three bathrooms, all that kind of good stuff, a kitchen and, um, and the consultation rooms. So it can be done. Uh, people think that they've got to have this big square footage, this, you know, big monstrous uh, place. But if you really know how you want to practice, mm-hmm. you design your practice uh, to fit that flow and that digital flow that you want, um, we can do it all day long in 3,000 square feet. And we're open four days a week. Very nice. Do you guys do any surgery there? Or are you mostly uh, cosmetic? We're mostly restorative. restorative. We we have some, because we're in the Metroplex, we have great, you know, oral surgeons and periodontists all around us. Mm-hmm. And so we do some minor surgeries, minor extractions and things like that, getting people, you know, out of pain and discomfort, but then getting them prepared and ready to go over to, let's say the oral surgeon or periodontist to, to have multiple implants placed or things like that. Um, we have it done over there. Very nice. 
Very nice. All right. So I'd love to pivot into kind of some of the philosophies that uh, that you hold um, and that you kind of embody in your dental practice. So tell me about some of the influences or influencers that that led you down this road to focusing a lot on the oral systemic connection. Absolutely. So are you familiar with um, Brad Bell, Dr. Brad Bell and Dr. Amy Donin? Have you ever heard about them or yeah. Eat the Heart Attack Gene book? Yep. I've yeah. read it. I've read so it. Good stuff. They are super. Yeah, it is. I can tell that you um, uh, are very focused on fitness, <laughs> just yeah. looking at you. And, <laughs> and so you. I'm like, somebody's working out. <laughs> Um, so I had a feeling you might have heard of Brad and Amy, but Mm -hmm. their book is amazing and their philosophy is amazing. They do a great job with a very intense two, two and a half day, um, teaching, you know, program Mm -hmm. where you are sitting right next to all kinds of people in the medical world as well. So Mm -hmm. the dental industry and the medical industries and specialties are sitting side by side, learning very intensely together all about the root causes of inflammation and what is contributing to cardiovascular disease. Mm -hmm. And then also how to treat that. And and they do such a wonderful job through the science, all science based, of course, um, of really showing everyone the science behind how important the dental and oral health of the patient is is in a positive way or a negative way affecting them. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, I started learning about that and training with them probably 10 years ago. I'd have to really look at the calendar. Mm -hmm. And um, when I came home, it it was, I I don't know, I'll share a little story with you if you don't mind for a second. I, I was so blown away with the information And I prided myself so much at that time that I was taking such amazing care of my patients Mm -hmm. that I literally on the plane ride home had a panic attack. I've never had a panic (laughs) attack before. And I had one on the plane because I was like, oh, my God, like, what have I done? Like, I haven't been taking care of my patients the best that I can. Mm -hmm. And once I kind of calmed down from that, I was like, "Okay, well, you didn't know what you didn't know. Mm -hmm. But now that you know what you know, what are you going to do about it? And I literally on that plane ride home, I told myself I would never practice another way. Like moving forward, I would always incorporate this into my practice and always do my very best to be able to take care of the patients as a whole person, not just a part or piece of them, not just teeth, Mm -hmm. not just a pretty smile, but how it all fits together and how much we can help influence our patients' overall health and well-being. They really see us and have better, stronger, longer relationships with with their dental team than they do most of their medical providers. And so we've found that we've really become uh, a very integral role in, in their health. And because of that, it's really created a foundational part of our business Mm -hmm. that has supported our business for many years. We have patients that have been with us now 20 plus years because even during COVID, they wanted to return right back to our office because they knew and had been educated how important it was to keep being seen, right? Yeah. And so because of that, They came right back. They weren't fearful. They knew we were going to take care of them. They knew what we were going to do the best we could when we reopened to make sure that they were safe. And, you know, that to me is what loyalty and and keeping those patients in your practice is so critical for the health and the well-being of your practice, right? Of course. You keep spending money trying to get new patients. And if you're not doing a good job taking care of them, then it's just like a siphon. They're dropping and leaking right out the bottom, right? Mm -hmm. But if you take great care of them and you show them and educate them and create value for you and your team, then guess what? That money, that effort that you spend on new patients is is worth it because they actually stay in the practice long-term. Amazing, amazing. A couple questions. So as far as integration and bringing this information home, um, you were moved by your training with... um, Bell and Donine and um, you're, you are a zealot because of, you know, the, the book that you read and, and the, the results that you've seen over a long period of time. But when you were 
first initially trying to integrate this into your office, what kind of pushback did you get from your team? Because although this is scientifically based, evidence based, I mean, you're looking at professionals, physicians, dentists that that resist this type of information. How did you integrate this and get buy in from your team first and then your associates? Hmm. So hard to go back and even remember exactly that far. I'll actually tell you this. My team, the professionals that have come or gone from my practice who embrace this with me, like they're all in. Mm-hmm. I, I I will put my hygienist next to any in the country. I mean, when they get their hands on this kind of amazing information and that they realize now they're not just flickers and pickers, that they actually are super important in saving these people's lives, they get excited about it. Mm-hmm. And they take such pride in it that once I just, you know, if you want to say had them drink from the well or had them drink from the, you know, from the, um, from the poison, if you want to say too, like, like they really run this program now because it really falls in their hands and the doctors are just really here to support them to do what they know to do now and that we've given them the systems around it. I'll tell you that the hardest pushback and feedback that I've had is more on the medical side of things. Mm. It's not the dental professionals that have really any um, hesitation in in moving forward with this that I find. It's more the medical professionals. And I've do- knocked on a ton of doors, met a lot of people, talked to a lot of cardiologists. Um, and, and really, they're the ones that have such a hard problem with this. And, and I feel like for the most part, it's that... I feel like they were taught maybe the, the the oral cavity and how important it was maybe for like, we get lucky maybe two hours in their whole curriculum. But if you really step back and think about how many hours we learn about the overall body, the overall, you know, way that physiology, that everything works, that's more than half of what we're taught and trained and educated in dental school about. Mm -hmm. So I feel like it's just, it's a super easy, um, you know, path for dentistry. And I think it's super hard for the medical field to understand. Plus they actually deductive reasoning wise, I don't think they think exactly like we do so systematically and kind of that comprehensive treatment planning process where Mm -hmm. we're so good at, you know, seeing everything, treatment planning, everything, sequencing, everything. Um, it's not quite the same way that I've found in the, in the medical world. Um, they're very test oriented Mm. test for this, read this test and only kind of pay attention to that test. I find a lot of them have a lot of blinders on, but it's a taught thing for them. I don't blame them. It's, it's literally part of the curriculum. They're taught to kind of look through their own set of blinders, whatever specialty they are in. Mm -hmm. And forget that the rest of the body is still attached to their specialty. Sure. And I think dentistry has done a great job even more now than even 10 years ago of realizing that the whole body is affected by inflammation. Yeah. Good stuff. So tell me about the armamentarium in your office. I mean, uh, there are certain levels of integration of, you know, the Balandonine technique or the Balandonine philosophies. You know, we have microscopes, we have cultures, we have um, biopsies. So what is exactly your protocol and what do you utilize for, um, you know, testing and for patient education? Wonderful. I'm going to tell you, we pretty much over the years have tried it all, but we have, because we do run a business, you Mm -hmm. have to get to a place where you have a system that not only works, but is super helpful in communication, not only to the patient, but to the physicians and the doctors and the specialists. If they are, let's talk about the the medical side of things. When they are used to having a test run, receiving a uh, report on that test, then that's the communication in which they're used to communicating in. Mm -hmm. So we utilize uh, tone beam, beams mm-hmm. and then we um, have those read by beam readers and of course we're 
um, asking for certain things in certain areas. But because of that, it comes back in a very uh, report-like um, system, which we can then share with the physicians and with the patients as we're trying to explain things. And then we also use, we've used oral DNA for many years. There's a lot of other saliva um, sampling types of companies out there. But then we also get that report, which is very clear as to which bacteria, how much of the level it is. We can come back around at any time that we want to or need to, and we can retest to show our levels again. We use intraoral camera pictures because they're fabulous at showing the inflammation. We have a certain kind of like an FMX series of x-rays. We have an FMX, if you want to say, of intraoral camera pictures. We take them the same way, the same sequence every single time so that we can go back because a picture is worth a thousand words. And even a patient who knows nothing about what we're doing can look at those with us and see their progress That's cool. because like we always tell them, we want to look at it and say, is it the same? Is it better or worse? And then that's how we help move them forward into treatment. Got it. Got it. So, uh, you know, you mentioned patient education, a, a big part of this and being able to integrate this into your, your patient population is being able to communicate effectively. What does that sound like? And, and what does that look like? Um, so you, you've told me about the battery of tests and, and I'm sure that helps. Do you refer to different peer reviewed articles, scientific literature? Um, uh, are we drawing that link right there and saying, Hey, this is your family history or you have a greater predilection towards this and you got to watch this because of the oral bacteria. What does that sound like? Talk, talk me through that because it's almost like you have to deprogram a patient base based on specifically if they were, you know, uh, at a, at a bloody profi practice or, or an under diagnosis practice, um, you have your work cut out for you when you're trying to integrate something big like this. You do. And you know, sadly enough, they don't really want to know the science behind it. Yeah, They really don't. I used to think when I was younger, they wanted to know all the fun, cool, nerdy stuff that I knew. And I, I would just babble on for hours about what I knew and it would just make me feel so good and so important. And you know what? <laughs> they don't want to know that. They don't guys. care. They, they don't. Care. don't. Oh. They want to know what they need to know and and know and trust that you know more than they do and that um that that you have the answers that they need. So really the more simplistic the more the more years we've done this, the more simplistic we get. And basically where this is kind of what it sounds like, if you want me to give you the kind of little spill. Yeah, I'd love is what it. You really that's exactly, have. that's exactly yeah. what I want. I want to okay. I pretend I'm going to give you the little spill. Pretend I'm, I'm pretend a patient. You're in front of me. Yeah, yeah, please, yeah. please. Yeah. You're, you're the spill in front of me. Okay. Mark, it's so great to have you here today. I'm so glad that Dr. Wood sent you here. She is so smart. She knows exactly you, she knows exactly why you're here in our office. You, though, on the other hand, may not understand why she wanted you to come see us versus the dentist down the street that you're going to go see. And I'm going to explain that to you for here for just a couple of minutes because I really want you to understand this. So Dr. Woods has seen something in your blood work called inflammatory markers that are too high for you. And she's concerned about that because she knows that it is not good for your heart or for your cardiovascular disease, or I'll point out whatever it is in the medical history that's that's not working for them. And a lot of times they're already shaking their head yes, because mm -hmm. they understand that she already said that before they got to the office. Sure. So I am basically telling them how great she is and that they should trust her and that I've already gotten all of the information from her office. I've already reviewed it. Mm -hmm. And here's what we're going to do today. Today is going to be a simple day. It is going to be a day of actually just gathering diagnostics because just like all of your medical team, we need some really important diagnostics as well. And I'm going to boil it down super simple for you. You're going to, we're going to be looking for two things. One test that we're going to do is called oral DNA. It's going to be a test of your saliva. And we're going to be able to send that in. And we're going to know exactly how much bacteria is going on in a negative way in your mouth. Nobody's sterile. 
But we want to see if any of the what we call bad bugs are the ones associated with cardiovascular disease are super, super high in there. And if they're sitting around the teeth, around your gums, then they're also very high in your bloodstream. And we're going to try to determine if that's happening. And if so, then we'll let you know um, based on that what kind of periodontal therapy we're going to be recommending to you. The second thing that we're going to do as well is we are going to use a specific type of x-ray that not all dentists have in their office. We're going to add a third dimension. Most of the time you're used to getting two-dimensional x-rays, we're going to add a third dimension. And what we're going to be specifically searching for are undiagnosed dental infections. Mm. And sometimes they don't even hurt. So that's what we're going to be looking for. We're going to send that off to a radiologist. We're going to have them help us determine if that is happening anywhere. We can also look at bone loss. We can look at your airway space. And we can also see if there's any carotid artery calcifications in your neck area during that period of time. Once we get those diagnostics back, we're going to review everything. And then we're going to sit down with you and we're going to explain it all to you. And then we'll determine the next steps for you. How does that sound? Sounds great. What is inflammation? Why is inflammation bad for me, doctor? Especially if it doesn't hurt. Especially if it doesn't hurt. We have come to realize in medicine that all diseases, especially chronic diseases, start with inflammation. And so I have a, I have a little picture um, of a tree with a lot of roots. Mm -hmm. uh, it came specifically from Beldonine mm -hmm. and the root structure shows all of these different like, um, um, uh, aspects of health that can be inflammatory in nature. And it kind of has a picture of a flame coming up and everything. Mm -hmm. And so we just kind of talk about those and pinpoint out a couple of them, high cholesterol, genetics, um, um, periodontal disease, um, dental infections, um, sleep apnea. And we just kind of talk them through that. Um, usually because of the way we have our health history, I'll know if they're already dealing with some sleep issues or sleep apnea. And uh, I'll tell them that the third thing, if we, we if we don't pinpoint anything out in, in the, the two primary things that I'm, you know, really focused on for you, then the next thing that we start to look at is airway space and sleep. Gotcha. A lot of times they'll also already have their, um, I'll already have their paperwork uh, from their, their docs with their results on their blood work. And I'll be able to circle which ones of the um, results, like the high results that is concerning for the doctors and say, you know, down the road, we'll be able to use these uh, blood tests down the road to see and monitor our progress. Because gotcha. once we find the infections and once we take care of them, within literally six to eight weeks, their blood work will look completely different once identified properly and taken care of. So it it's a faster result than you can even imagine. So when somebody has a cardiologist, for instance, that is resistant to this type of information and you see that they're high risk, especially considering the fact that they have a cardiologist and they're, they're already in cardiac care or maybe they're post MI or something like that. And there's just resistance there. I mean, they're adults, they can make their own decision, especially in concert with their cardiologist. But how do you typically handle that without stepping on toes? I tell them this, like, we're so blessed to have cardiologists. They are absolutely amazing. They save lives every day. Um, but for me personally, I feel like by the time you've gotten to a cardiologist or God bless, you've already had an event that I see them as the plumbers. They are the plumbers. They go in and they roto root and they go in and they got to open something back up again. Mm -hmm. If we don't do something to prevent that from happening again, then you will go back to the plumber and you will get to have another event and you'll get to see them some more. Mm -hmm. How about instead of waiting for that to happen, we start to look at the preventive ways of how to, I don't know, use Drano if you want to say, like use something a little bit easier to go in there and help open things up and to keep some of that blockage from happening. And so when I use kind of analogies like that, people kind of understand, you know, 
in in layman's terms, and that's really, I guess, what I want to point out from everything that I've talked about today. I didn't talk about the science. I didn't spit it out to them. I talked in layman's terms. Mm -hmm. And if you want patients to understand and to to value and and understand your worth and your expertise, then talk to them on their level. Talk to them on their layman term level. Here's the deal. There's some people who don't want to know all that. There's a few people who want to know everything. And when they want to know the actual science and the scientific aspects, then I point them to the right books. I point them, you know, to our library and point them to certain studies. And then they can have all of that information too. So it's not like I'm trying to hide any of the information from them. It's just that adult extension spans are like 17 minutes. So you got 17 good minutes to get in what you want to get in. (laughs) Other than that, they're probably not going to hear anything else. And so I got to pick my words very wisely and try to get the most out of them having an understanding of what it is that we're trying to move them towards. Because we have other opportunities to keep educating them. It doesn't all have to be educated the very first time we're ever talking to them about it. But it does start on the phone with with our front office team. It does, you know, secondly, start off with asking the right kind of questions on the health history so that they understand that we we want to know more information than the average, you know, person does. And that's OK. And then we reference it when they're in there the first time so that they know that we've already looked at it and that we are already very familiar with this ca- with their case. It gives them a lot of um confidence in what we have to say next because we're prepared when they come in. And if you think about it, how many other places do you even go um, where you do business with somebody and actually they're doing their business very well? Mm -hmm. Like they're servicing you very well from the get-go. Because there's not that many types of businesses out there that are doing that these days, you are very much, um, well, it's just a great experience. It's a great experience for them. And they notice that right off the bat. Yep. Got it. So uh, once you have a diagnosis, lab work comes back, radiologist report comes back, what are the different um, treatment protocols that you guys utilize in your office to, to treat, to treat this diagnosis? Yeah. Great. Well, obviously if we have found any type of unidentified um, dental infection, um, I, I I won't sit and debate our root canals good, our root canals not good, are all root canals bad, you know, all kinds of things like that. I'll tell you that we are very specific about trying to understand is a tooth having a dental infection? Mm-hmm. And just because it doesn't hurt doesn't mean it's not there. Mm-hmm. And so we do uh, obviously highlight ourselves to any and all root canals that have uh, been done in somebody's mouth. And we're checking those out for any type of secondary infections. We are not anti root canals in the sense that if it doesn't have an infection and it doesn't seem like it's a, a, a true problem, we're not just going to start taking all root canals out. Okay. Mm-hmm. But, but I do see many times where a root canal has uh, has a secondary infection. And therefore, when that does happen, we are not in favor of retreatments. We're in favor of extractions. And now since implants are so amazingly wonderful, mm-hmm. um, then we would go with an implant or bridge type of scenario. Um, that's number one. And then of course, with our periodontal therapy, um, again, I could debate all day long on some of this stuff with the science, mm-hmm. but I'll tell you that we feel like if someone has the need of too high of a bacterial load, then we are going to um, begin periodontal therapy on that patient. We like to treat the whole mouth at the same time, because just like a wound on your knee, you wouldn't go in and have half of the wound treated today and next week come back and have the other half of the wound treated. So we feel like when we're going to treat, we're going to treat the whole mouth at the same time. Um, Many a times we are placing them on a regimen of antibiotics um, that's supported by the bacteria that load that we find. Um, Again, I could debate that a lot, but remember, we are trying to reduce the load, not just around the teeth, but in the systemic bloodstream. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not 
for or against antibiotics, but when needed and when it can be that specific, then I, I do believe that that is the most effective way to handle the situation um, when we need to treat the patients. And here's the weird thing. We're also not talking about um, super obvious um, late stage or late phase periodontal disease. Many a times we're talking about early and, and middle range periodontal disease. So we're not talking huge, huge pockets. We may even be talking about one problem area with just a little bit of problem areas in a couple of other spots, but that doesn't mean that that isn't enough to have to be treated. Sure. And so depending on, you know, that, then, then we, we, we move on. We have about a two week turnaround period of time. We like to see the patients back because I like to know that the therapy that we actually put them through is making good results that fast. And then we kind of start them back on a three month routine after that. Cool. Awesome. Because I don't want to wait, you know, six months or three months to see them back to see if it works. Mm -hmm. Because it, what if they have bad oral hygiene? Like it could already be bad again. Sure. I want to know that our therapy was effective. Got it. Excellent. Excellent. So um, I'll close out with this question, Jill. Uh, if somebody wants to get further trained in this or somebody wants to start integrating these techniques and this philosophy into their dental practice, what's your best advice? Well, obviously they could go straight to Beldonine. I think it is a great fundamental, um, you know, if, if they're questioning the science behind it, they certainly need to go get that answered first. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful program. And I know that if you just even Google search that, I'm, I'm sure that would come right up uh, the Beldonine method. Um, other than that, like, this is my passion. Reach out to me. I will talk to anybody about this stuff. I don't care where you practice in the country. There is room for everybody to be able to practice like this. So um, as far as I'm concerned, just find me on Facebook, LinkedIn, Jill Wade. I'm all over the place. Uh, call the dental office, Stonebriar Small Design. Get my phone number and we will just have a great conversation about what we can do to help people, you know, Get excited. Get their hygienist excited about this. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Jill, I can't thank you enough for your time today. I appreciate you passing on your wisdom and sharing some of your philosophies with the audience. I think this is, I mean, I'm, I'm a big believer in the oral systemic link. Um, I don't believe that the mouth should be uh, separated from the rest of the body as far as an overall health kind of uh, philosophy. So, um, people like you, I'm, I'm more than happy to talk about this on the air as often as possible because the more people that integrate this into their practice, the healthier the patients are going to be out there. So thanks again. And I appreciate your time. Mm, thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Jill Wade.